Good morning and, and welcome everyone to the ninth annual Betty Ann and Wade Heggie Lectureship in Integrative Medicine. This lecture was started in 2005 for the following purpose, to support the cost of lectures and or other delivery methods to provide continuing education opportunities for faculty, residents, and practitioners in the field of complementary and alternative medicine. And there's an endowment to support this lecture in perpetuity. So this lecture uh, brings high profile, knowledgeable, and experienced physicians to our college to address current topics in complementary and integrative medicine. Integrative medicine reaffirms the importance of the relationship between the patient and the doctor, focuses on the whole person, is informed by evidence, and makes use of all appropriate therapeutic approaches, healthcare professionals, and disciplines to achieve optimal health and healing. It's integrated medicine has recently become a board certified medical specialty. It is now being taught in virtually every medical school in Canada and the United States. Betty Ann and Wade Hege have both been prominent members of the business, volunteer, and philanthropic communities in this province for many years. Wade has been involved in aviation, life insurance, and financial planning, and has held prominent volunteer roles with several community-based organizations. Betty Ann has had an illustrious career as a senior executive in corporate relations in the potash industry and has held numerous directorships in the public and private sector. The Heggies have been wonder wonderful supporters of the University of Saskatchewan and have also provided tremendous volunteer assistance in attracting other donors to the university. Wade and Betty Ann have both extensive personal experience in leading integrative health centers throughout North America. This lectureship created through their gift to the College of Medicine is their way of articulating their vision for integrative medicine in this province. Betty Ann and Wade, if you could both stand so our audience can recognize you. And now our speaker, doc, Dr. Emilia Villagomez. Now we, we have the privilege of hearing from Dr. Villagomez, uh, who will speak to current and emerging evidence-based developments in integrative psychiatry. Dr. Villagomez is a psychiatrist and a clinical assistant professor in both the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Arizona and in the College of Medicine at the University of Saskatchewan. She received her medical degree from Texas A&M Health Science Center College of Medicine. She completed her psychiatric residency at Yale University School of Medicine. Dr. Villagomez also did a fellowship in child psychiatry at Harvard University and a fellowship in integrative medicine at the University of Arizona. That's an impressive list of credentials. Please join me in a warm welcome to our ninth Betty Ann and Wade Hege lecturer, Dr. Amelia Villagomez. All right, good afternoon. I'm gonna set the timer because I can do a lot of talking, so I'm just gonna set the timer. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here with you all this afternoon, um, and I'm very grateful to the Heggie family, as well as to you all, to be able to discuss some really exciting research that's coming out in integrative medicine. Um, so we'll just go ahead and start right along. So the objectives you've probably seen before, um, we're going to talk about what is integrative psychiatry, we're going to look at the evidence base, and then we're going to learn about um, different tools online that you can use to look up questions that patients might have since we'll only be doing a very bit of talking today about integrative psychiatry. There is so much to learn, which is a good thing. So first we'll talk about a case, um, a patient that I met about a year ago. Um, we'll define integrative medicine. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the gut microbiome, um, the effects of nutrition on mental health. We'll talk about omega-3s, light therapy, N-acetylcysteine, mindfulness-based therapies, and then we'll take what we've learned today to use um, it to address the patient that comes in front of us. Don't have any disclosures. 
So what is integrative medicine? There was a great explanation that was already offered here today. And just to highlight a bit of pieces, um, the idea is that patient and clinicians are partners in the healing process. My job is to facilitate that process, not to, to tell the patient what to do, but to really elicit from the patient what's important to them in their life. With integrative medicine, it neither rejects conventional medicine nor accepts alternative therapies uncritically. And most importantly, the practitioners are called to exemplify themselves self-exploration and self-development. Just the other day, we were talking about mindfulness for ADHD in our journal club in psychiatry. And one of, the, one of my fellow doctors said, you know, the thing about mindfulness is that in order to, pra in order to teach it, you, you kind of have to practice it. So, you know, then that may be one thing that gets in the way of actually doing this for our patients. And then he said, but actually, maybe we should be doing this anyways. So I think this really points to the fact that if our patients see Diet Coke and if they see lots of um, processed foods um, on our desks, are they going to really listen to us when we talk about the importance of eating fruits and vegetables? In fact, there was a recent study that came out with kindergarten students. And they told the kindergarten students how important it is to have fruits and vegetables and so forth um, in one group. And the other group, they only had an apple on the teacher's desk. And then they looked to see which groups were eating more fruits and vegetables. And I think you can probably know what happened. The group that just saw the apple had more fruits and vegetable intake than those who heard about the theoretical benefits and how it's important. It didn't matter. What it mattered was what they saw. And I think this really speaks to the fact why we as physicians have to commit ourselves to self-exploration and self-development, which is a good side effect of, for, which do, of doing this. And lastly, to address all factors that deal with mind, spirit, body, and emotions. And these aren't new concepts. In fact, they're very ancient concepts. And we see them in many traditions, including that of the medicine wheel, where it exemplifies the importance of mind, body, spirit, and emotions. So at the heart of integrative medicine is empowering patients for self-care with, of course, the use of medications and surgeries and other modalities when important. OK, so here's our patient. Jerry comes to me 2015 in December. December is important. We'll find out why later. Um, but he says, you know, I have a history of ADHD. Um, I've had some anxiety and depression, worsening of OCD symptoms. And this has been going on for about a year. Um, in the context of starting high school, although he does say things are a little bit better over the past month. He describes ruminative thoughts, feeling extremely self-conscious. You know, his sleeping pattern is not the best, but he tells me, hey, it's like all my friends, you know, I'm on Facebook or Netflix until 1 a.m. Um, I wake up at 7.30 and I'm exhausted, so I take naps. He says, my diet's really good. You know, it's pretty healthy. A bowl of cereal for breakfast, small sandwich for lunch, and fast food or chicken and veggies the rest of the time. And oh, by the way, I have about a pot of coffee a day. Past medical history, pretty healthy. Um, in kind of passing, he said, yeah, I'm going to have a tonsillectomy, but you probably don't really care about that. I'm like, no, no, tell me more. He said, well, I've had about nine or 10 strep infections, um, and I've been on lots of courses of antibiotics. OK, well, that's kind of interesting, because he does tell me things are worse over the past year. And in the past year, he's had all these strep infections. OK. He said that Concerta made things uh, much better. So he's been on that for a while. But Sertraline made things a lot worse. Um, and he's on currently probiotics and vitamin D. Um, he, he has a family history of bipolar disorder. Otherwise, his developmental history and social history um, were non-contributory. So Jerry says to me, you know, I need something quick to fix my anxiety. I've been on your wait list for 18 months. Um, please give me something. And I uh, how about Xanax, he says. My girlfriend takes Xanax, and I see that really chills her out. Can, can you give me some, too? And mom says, you know, is there anything different that you can give other than antidepressant? Because he had a really bad reaction to it, um, and his cousin had a bad reaction to it. And by the way, the natural path who we saw, because we've been waiting for so long, um, started him on some probiotics. And what do you think of that? So preliminary diagnoses were uh, generalized anxiety disorder, ADHD, major depressive disorder. And um, before I get to that, I'll also mention all these slides are available on the internet. I'll show you the, the link for it at the end of the presentation so you don't have to take copious notes. All right, so going back to our case. 
as I was sitting with this patient, um, around that time, this article came up, and I wondered, does this have anything to do with what my patient might be experiencing or contributing in any way? Um, essentially, what they did is they used a, a large UK database, which um, had approximately 100 million, I'm sorry, 1 million patients in it. And what they were able to show was an association between antibiotic exposure and an increased risk for depression. Now, again, this is an association, doesn't mean causation, but there is this association going on. They also noticed that the more antibiotics they got, the stronger that association and risk became. And the tra same was true for anxiety, but not for psychosis. So that's quite interesting. Why might antibiotic exposure be important? And looking at the data and the, all the research that's going on around the gut microbiome, I think that this may help us understand the previous study. So we'll dive into this area. The human body um, relies on the microbiota for several important, important functions. And essentially, the microbiota are all those organisms that live in, with us. So typically, mostly bacteria, but also viruses and fungi. And they live on those uh, surfaces of our body that interact with the outside world, uh, like our mouth, our skin, our gut, um, and other mucosal membranes. And the word gut microbiome, which you all probably have heard before, refers to the actual genes of the microbiota. Okay, so those are the two words. The microbiota refer to the organisms, the microbiome to the genes. And essentially, we have 100 trillion of these microorganisms living with us. And um, the combined weight is about one to two kilos, approximately the same size of our brain. So what are all these microorganisms doing? Well, really important things. They're metabolizing food for us, absorbing nutrients, synthesizing vitamins, um, and preventing colonization by pathogenic bacteria. So we got to take care of these critters. We know that the gut affects, the brain affects the gut, right? If we're really stressed, maybe we get butterflies in our stomach or we get a stomach ache. But now what the research over the past two um, decades is showing is that there is a bi-directional relationship. Our gut also affects our brain. And our gut does that through the neural endocrine and um, immune systems, and that is influenced by the microbiome and the microbiota. And this together is called the gut microbiome brain axis. The intestinal microbiota releases immune activating and other signaling molecules that play an important role in the regulation of the brain and subsequent behavior. So how do they do their job? Well, the research is still trying to figure this all out, but there's some uh, preliminary hints from animal studies. Um, and they show that these microorganisms um, can manufacture and secrete neurochemicals serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine, GABA, acetylcholine, oxytocin. And depending on which microorganisms are in our guts, there's going to be varying levels of these chemicals being um, secreted. So now we'll talk about um, the fecal microbiota transplantation. All right. So you can tell this, this slide is juicy already. So it's been yet to be shown in humans, okay, but in animal studies. Um, they've demonstrated that it's possible to completely change the behavior of rodents, not by transplanting their brains, but by transplanting their gut. If fecal matter, and hence the microbiota, from an anxious mouse strain is transplanted into a young mice strain that is calm, the little mouse loses the behavioral legacy of their mellow genes and becomes highly anxious. Hmm. Luckily, the opposite is true, too. <laughs> if you take the micro, the, do a fecal microbiota transplantation from a strain that is calm and confident, place it into a mouse that comes from an anxious strain, that anxious mouse starts to develop the qualities of confidence and calmness. This has also been demonstrated in animal models of autism, fecal transplantation of certain um, microorganisms that are known to promote the um, secretion of oxytocin. So we know that these fecal microbiota transplantations or stool transplants are already being done for certain conditions like uh, Clostridium difficile, which is a very difficult to treat infection at times uh, of the body. Um, so we know that this is already happening. When it starts to happen with mental health, with psychiatry, 
not quite clear, but it also lets us know what we eat and how we feed those microorganisms are going to affect our mood. All right, so there have been lots of studies um, done in um, both animals and in healthy controls to give further evidence to this hypothesis. And this was a randomized trial to test the effect of a multi-species probiotic on cognitive reactivity to sad mood. So cognitive uh, reactivity is known to be um, a marker for depression. What is cognitive reactivity? Well, it's that degree to which a dysphoric state reactivates negative thinking patterns. In other words, we all have bad things happen to us during the day. But if we dwell on those things or tell ourselves that we're bad or that we need to be blamed for that or things are never going to change and we get in this tailspin of sorts, that's a high level of cognitive reactivity. Well, they were able to show in this study that using probiotics in healthy controls for four weeks was able to decrease cognitive reactivity, ruminative thought processes, um, and aggression. There have also been studies showing improvement in chronic fatigue and IBS with various strains of probiotics. This is the first study that, that I've seen and that I think is out there, and they mentioned that in the study too. Um, and it was published in 2016, just in March, in a population that had clinical depression, using probiotics as a treatment. And they used 40 patients. This was a double-blind, randomized, con placebo-controlled trial. And they gave one group um, probiotics and the other group um, a placebo. And they wanted to see if depression would improve, as well as other measures, uh, insulin sensitivity um, and uh, CRP, which is an indicator of inflammation. And sure enough, they were able to show extremely good compliance, 90%, which is really great in a clinical trial, um, and a, a, a significant drop in BDI, which is a scale used to look at markers of depression, as well as improvements in insulin levels and decrease in inflammation in the body. So that's quite, quite exciting. That's the first study. Um, and what's being figured out now is what strands do you give to different people? Right? Because maybe the person with IBS needs a different probiotic than the person with depression. And so all of these things are still being researched, but what we're understanding is the microbiome is really important for our mood, and we can adjust it by both taking probiotics, but also by feeding ourselves the right types of foods. So side effects of probiotics, I'll just add this, um, common side effect could be flatulence. Um, typically, in a uh, person who is not immunocompromised, uh, the risks are considered quite negligible. Okay, so amongst that idea of, well, what, do you, what, what strain do you give to different people? Some people will say, well, why don't you just give fermented foods? Because then the body can figure it out. Well, fermented foods are essentially foods that have gone through a pickling method. During fermentation, starches and sugars are converted into lactic acid by the bacteria lactobacilli. Now, as a youth, uh, my mother is of a Persian background. I would always remember these jars in the garage. And they were, f they were filled with different types of um, radishes and peppers and cabbage. I'm like, Mom, what are you doing? She's like, well, I'm, I'm pickling. And I said, but, but why? That tastes awful. And this has been a, a tradition that has been very prominent in many different cultures, including the Persian culture, of fermenting our foods. Um, and so fermented foods are found in uh, kimchi, I'm sorry, fermented foods, some examples are kimchi, sauerkraut, um, yogurt, kefir, miso, tempeh. And there's been cross-sectional studies of college youth demonstrating that those who ate more fermented foods um, that contain, that were likely to contain probiotics, were, uh, had less, uh, fewer social anxiety symptoms. Now again, that's not causation, but it's an association, maybe because they were anxious, they were pickier eaters and didn't eat these types of foods. But typically when we see an association one way, often it can be a bi-directional association. So um, I certainly would want my mom to have more <laughs> fermented foods to help with uh, any anxiety she might have had. Anyways, so going on, uh, the, we'll talk about a little bit more about the gut microbiome brain axis. Essentially, the brain affects the gut. We talked about how the microbiome influences that, as well as how food influences our microbiome. 
um, as well as medications. So we talked about antibiotics, but antibiotics certainly aren't the only medication that affect which critters in our bodies um, thrive and survive. There was a recent concerning study, in my opinion, of um, how risperidone, which is a common medication used to treat um, oppositional defiant uh, disorder um, and disruptive behaviors, that show when people got risperidone, their, their micro flora changed, the microorganisms in their, um, their bodies changed into a set that was more likely associated with obesity. And they show that it was because of the, this shift in microorganisms that the resting metabolic rate shifted in the body, and that attributed for the weight gain. To me, as a child psychiatrist who, who often uses risperidone, um, it was a quite concerning study. We've always known uh, risperidone is associated with weight gain. But to think that the pill that I'm giving is changing what organisms the body is naturally producing and not for a positive shift um, is quite concerning because what might be the long-term implications? And I think that has to be part of the discussion in my own head when I'm thinking risk benefits, um, thinking specifically about, you know, I know that patient is going to be having more obesity, but is there any other effect that that change in the microbiome is going to have for the patient? All right, so we're going to talk now about fruits and vegetables and mood. Um, there's been plenty of studies. Oh, before we do that, I want to mention one more study. So um, there was a study that explored what would happen if a group of African Americans uh, swapped diets with a group of rural blacks living in South Africa. And the investigators were quite interested in this question because there was a huge difference in the rates of colon cancer among these two different populations, although sharing a similar genetic background. And so when they switched the diets, after 14 days, they noticed that those African Americans in Atlanta who had a diet mostly of processed foods, um, refined sugars, they swapped that diet with the typical South African diet, um, which was high in whole grains and, and uh, fiber, that their microflora changed. And it changed to microorganisms that released butyrate, uh, an increase in 300% of butyrate, um, which is a byproduct of bacterial fermentation in the colon and thought to protect against colon cancer. So quite interesting with just a shift in food, and maybe it doesn't have to be f for a long time before we can see that benefit. All right, so now fruits and vegetables and mood. So cross-sectional studies support the relationship between fruits and vegetable intake and happiness, optimism, and eudaimonia. Eudaimonia being that state of creativity and being in the flow. But again, people say, well, that's cross-sectional. If I'm in a bad mood, then I want to eat bad things. And if I'm in a good mood, I'm going to want to eat good things. In fact, that idea is supported with this study that says which came first, the mood or the food. And what they did is they offered people either M&Ms or grapes. And they, the group that had a neutral mood, 57% of the time, they said, I'll take those M&Ms. But the group that was in a good mood, only 30% of the time they said, I'll take those M&Ms, I'll, I'll take the grapes instead, right? Uh, or I'm sorry, the 30% said, I'll take the M&Ms. So we see that the way we feel is also going to affect our food choices. So then they did this study, which says many apples a day keeps the blues away. Daily experiences of negative and positive affect and food consumption in young adults. So they wanted to see which one came first. So they had them do a diary about their mood and then their fruit and vegetable consumption. And using various statistics, lagged analysis, showed that fruit and vegetable consumption predicted improvements in positive affect the next day and not vice versa. On days when people ate fruits and vegetables, they reported feeling calmer, happier, more energetic than they normally do. So the conclusion was fruits and vegetables may promote emotional well-being. But here's the kicker, OK? In order to get that improvement in mood, these people were eating seven to eight fruits and vegetables a day, OK? So it's not the you know three and four, have a salad if you can on the side. It was a huge amount of fruits and vegetables. So when I'm talking to my patients about eating fruits and vegetables, I'll say, you know, what we really want to do is maybe start a smoothie, right? Throw in a lot of those fruits and vegetables in the morning as you can because many teens aren't hungry in the morning, so if you have to drink your fruits and vegetables, um, and then to put throughout the day as well. 
And this idea that mood can, food can improve our mood is further supported by the fact that exercise, right? As soon as you exercise, most people report an improvement in their mood. It's pretty fast. And these researchers would say, well, why can't the same be true for food? The truth is it's a bi-directional relationship. But since we can't automatically change our mood at times, perhaps if we change our food, we, start, we get in somewhere in that, that feedback mechanism. All right. Other studies to support this, the Mediterranean diet in a longitudinal study of 10,000 Spanish adults find that adherence to a Mediterranean diet was protective against major depressive disorder. This has been further um, um, supported by studies in the Women's Health Initiative, which show that less refined fruits and less refined sugars were associated with a less risk of depression and anxiety. So we all probably hopefully are convinced, and we probably already thought it before we came in here, it's a good idea to eat your fruits and vegetables, but it's hard. It's hard to change someone's diet. In fact, one patient told me, Doc, I'm going to change my religion before I'm going to change my diet. You know what I mean? Like people, it's, it's so associated with every part of ourselves. They're, I'm just not going to change. I said, okay, well, that's fine. What do you want to change? And that's where motivational interviewing can come in. But um, so here are some tips that I've found to be helpful when talking with patients about uh, food. I say, first, let's just talk about it because it's important for your mental health. I'll ask them, what do you eat for breakfast, lunch, and dinner? And then I'll ask them um, to do a photo journal with pictures of everything you eat because I can't really get kids to write a food journal for me, but they're very used to having their cell phones and they always have it right there. So I said, just take a picture of everything you eat. And often what they eat changes by just taking a picture of it because they know they're going to show their doctor that. Um, and the, the other thing is to inquire about frequency of bowel movements. So often when I ask patients, how often do you poop? They'll say, um, you're a psychiatrist. And I say, yep, I know your brain is both here, but in your gut is kind of like your second brain. So I need to know if it's moving or not. And it's like trash. If it stays there too long, it gets really stinky. And I said, you need to move your bowels every day. So what are you doing for that? Okay, so daily bowel movements is what we need, that consistency, that routine to make sure that things aren't sticking around too long and causing a problem. Let's eat from the rainbow. So smaller kids will put this on the fridge and say, you know what, you get a prize if you eat one, color, one fruit or vegetable from every color because that means you're getting lots of different nutrients since various foods, uh, various colors can be indicative of various nutrients. Um, avoiding excessive caffeine, considering green tea instead. Green tea has L-theanine in it, which is um, an amino acid um, analog that is very calming. So that's often why when you take green tea, you get the benefit of the caffeine, but you also have that calmness. So it doesn't have the same effect as caf uh, a pot of coffee where you're really wired, right? You have that more of a balance there. Um, the other nice little tip about green tea is that the benefits um, of a lot of the antioxidants are in there even after the first steep. So the first steep you get the um, caffeine part and then you can use it six more times to continue to really get all those um, nutrients and the antioxidants out of the green tea and it's a great thing to have just during the day. And then the other practical advice, like we talked about before, really trying to move towards seven and eight fruits and vegetables a day. And if the patient's telling me they're not eating any, then I'm going to start with three because I want them to have a sense of success of coming in and saying, yeah, I did that. And it felt a little bit better. All right, seafood. This is the next word I say to patients that I see a ugh feeling, right? Like seafood, I'm not going to eat seafood, that's weird. But I talk to them about the importance of it because it has a lot of vitamin D, iodine, um, chromium in it. Bivalves like mussels, oysters, and clams are in the top sources of vitamin B12 and zinc. And here's a really great statistic to remember. Six oysters provide uh, about 250% of our recommended B12, but 500% of our recommended zinc. So if you can have six oysters a week, then you can get the am amount of zinc that you probably need overall. And we know about 60 to 70% of people are deficient in zinc. Zinc is a really important mineral, especially for adolescents, because you need zinc with all the bone growth that's going on, right? So we need to make sure that people are eating a lot of zinc. And if I, if I find vegetarians, for example, that aren't eating any meat, then I ask, well, how about seafood? Is that OK for you? And if, if it is, and we talk about the importance of, of um, oysters um, and uh, the bivalves, because um, 
they need a lot of zinc during that time. And there have been lots of studies to, to postulate that during periods of high stress, we might actually use a lot more zinc and uh, deplete it. Um, so that's kind of ongoing. But I think if we can use food in general, we're pretty safe with our recommendations. OK, so another great resource is the um, EWG's Consumer Guide to Seafood. Because a lot of patients will say, you know, doc, I eat seafood. I get all the omega-3s that you're telling me I should have. Um, I have tilapia three times a week. That's, that's pretty good, isn't it? And I said, well, I don't know. Let's, let's look at this. Um, and what you do with the seafood calendars, you, uh, calculators, you put in your weight, your age, your gender. And then it gives a list of which ones are recommended um, to have high levels of omega-3s and low in mercury and are sustainable for the environment versus those that are less good and those that might even be harmful in excess. And so I show, OK, well, the tilapia is actually low in mercury, which is good, um, but it can also be low in omega-3. So maybe we need to look at a different source for that. Speaking of omega-3s, um, I'll often tell kiddos, omega-3s are like WD-40 for your brain. It helps the brain cells talk to one another. And essentially, the scientific jargon for that would be increased serotonergic neurotransmission, alteration in dopaminergic function, modulation of heart rate variability, anti-inflammatory, alteration in cell membrane fluidity, and reducing expression of inflammatory genes. See? WD-40 for the brain, right? It's a better way to describe it. Um, and there are three types of omega-3s, which are considered essential fatty acids, because you need it. You can't get it anywhere else but your diet. And the total intake by adolescents was only 30% of the recommended amount of omega-3s, which is a bit concerning. So there has been a lot of study of omega-3s, some saying it's good, some saying it increases the risk of prostate cancer, some saying it's the best thing for your health, some saying it doesn't matter. So I'm just going to focus really on depression. Um, and there was one study looking at omega-3s, and this was a meta-analysis. So they put lots of studies together, and they showed no effect for omega-3s in depression. And then they did another meta-analysis, and they said, well, how about we break it down? Because not all fish oil is considered equal. There's some with high EPA, and there's some with low EPA. And when they did that, they saw that the supplements with high EPA had an effect size of about 0.55, which in scientific jargon is a pretty modest effect size. Small would be about 0.2, modest would, moderate, I should say, would be about 0.5, and large is about 0.8. So those with greater than 60% had an effect size of about 0.55 versus those with less um, than 60% had no effect. So if we're talking to our patients about omega-3s, then we want to talk to them about an EPA-rich supplement. Um, because without that, they may not be getting what they, they could best be benefited by. There's also been studies done with ADHD. And when they did the same meta-analysis with ADHD, they noticed a small effect size of a 0.3. So I'll say to parents, you know, if stimulants for ADHD are about this effective, because stimulants are very effective for ADHD, then uh, fish oil is about this effective. So it's not this, but it's not this either. So let's think about what foods your, your son or daughter are eating as well as if we can start some fish oil for them. And the other thing that makes this um, omega-3 fatty acid supplementation question really interesting is that we know that ADHD is very heritable, right? If I see a kid with ADHD, I'll look at both of the parents and I'll say, which one of you, right? Um, so we know it's very heritable. And at the same time, is it possible that the way it's transferred is through a, a, a polymorphism affecting fatty acid, uh, polyunsaturated fatty acid metabolism? Because the studies that have shown that kids with ADHD have lower amounts of essential fatty acids actually show that they ate the same amount as their peers, but they had lower blood levels. So might that be a polymorphism? Is that possibly one of the genetic variants and possibly one of the reasons why in some subpopulations it might be genetic? It's, it's quite an intriguing question. It hasn't been um, fully investigated, but, but um, mechanism-wise, it's certainly plausible. 
So they put together a committee of American psychiatrists and they said, what do you guys think about omega-3s? And this is what their recommendations were for patients with mood and anxiety um, and psychiatric disorders. They said all adults should eat fish greater than two times a week and patients with mood, impulse control, psychotic disorders should consume one gram per day and a supplement may be useful in patients with mood disorders. Greater than three grams should be monitored by a physician because of possible side effects. So takeaway points, mechanism of action, increased membrane fluidity, use products high in EPA, typical dose is one to two grams, take it with a meal for best absorption. There are also liquid preparations available. And typically people notice a, a subtle effect in one month. Um, and then three months is typically the time frame that I'll use before I figure is this helpful or not for the patient's condition. So mercury in fish is a great question. So you also have to be quite aware of where your products are coming from. And there's various sites, especially consumer labs, um, that has tested the mercury in various of these supplements to be able to look at it. So yeah, we have to be careful what we're, what we're buying, too, that not any product is considered equal. Possible side effects include nausea, loose stools, fishy aftertaste, and very commonly kids will say, I get a fishy burp. I don't like that. I'm not taking it anymore. I said, well, did you put it in the freezer like we talked about? Oh, you said the freezer? I said, yes, because you put it in the freezer, that fishy burp is likely not to be there. Um, and so the other thing is greater than three grams a day can inhibit blood coagulation, might suppress the immune system, and can increase, can increase LDL. Um, all right. So the idea is fish oil plus french fries plus hamburger, you're okay, right? No, 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 no. I tell my patients it's not about just adding a supplement. It's about really looking at the whole picture about having less processed food, less junk food, um, having foods that if your great-grandmother doesn't recognize it, maybe you shouldn't be eating it, that sort of advice. All right. So next we'll talk about N-acetylcysteine. So you all are probably familiar with N-acetylcysteine because it's given um, in the emergency room after a Tylenol overdose. But now it's coming um, into play in psychiatry for compulsive disorders. Um, it's a derivative of the amino acid L-cysteine. It easily crosses the cell membrane where it's converted to cysteine and subsequently glutathione. And it modulates glutamatergic systems and offering promise in the reduction of compulsive behaviors. So I'll just give one example of some of the studies that have been looking at this. OCD, um, what they did in this trial is they used it as an adjunct um, to SSRIs in individuals who were non-responsive to treatment. And they gave about 600 milligrams in the beginning, then they doubled weekly until they got to about 2,400 milligrams a day. And the group receiving this intervention had a 53%, I'm sorry, 53 of the patients receiving N-acetylcysteine, or NAC as it's commonly referred to, showed a full clinical response compared only to 15% in placebo. And OCD is a very difficult, uh, very difficult um, disorder to treat. So I think this is a pretty impressive study that was done here. And in the, the journal, the editorial was done, and it said, given N-acetylcysteine's relatively benign side effect profile, ready availability and low cost, which is about uh, $20 a month, um, clinicians and patients might make informed joint decisions to consider a trial of therapy, particularly if standard first and second line therapies have failed. So the reason I bring this up is because we have one study um, I think this is in the process of being replicated. So when I speak to my patients about this, I'll say, well, you, here are the different options. This is what we know. We know that it's, um, for most people, they have limited side effects. There's been this one study. Here are the other options. And it's really a joint decision-making process. There have also been studies looking at N-acetylcysteine for autism, um, looking at the stereotypies and the compulsive behaviors for autism, as well as trichotillomania, which is the excessive hair pulling in adults, has been shown to be helpful with N-acetylcysteine. There's also been studies, although mixed studies, in addictions. Um, marijuana has the best benefit. And what I'll typically say to my patients is, okay, so do you want to cut down on the marijuana? Yes, doc, I want to because you said I need to to continue with the concerta. Okay, Yes, I want to stop the marijuana. Okay, great. Well, I have a supplement that may help decrease the cravings. Do you want to take it? 
Um, actually, no, no, I, I think I'm okay for now. Well, that gives me some information right there, but nonetheless, N-acetylcysteine has had some uh, two studies to show um, decrease in cravings w in a, when it was used in the context of a drug rehab program. So side effects include um, typically well tolerated, um, but GI adverse side effects are the most common. Nausea, abdominal pain, vomiting, diarrhea, increased appetite. Um, and there are some animal studies to suggest it may have hypotensive effects when combined with already blood pressure lowering medicine and may increase the risk of bleeding at higher doses when combined with other herbs and um, medications. And so we'll talk at the end about a database that you can go to to look at some of these um, nuances when, when discussing with patients various options. All right, this one I think is extremely pertinent when we live in Saskatchewan. And I think it's amazing how many patients of mine have never heard of a light box. I think I'm from Arizona and I know what an air light box is. <laughs> um, I think light boxes are quite important. Um, and essentially, in this study, they were looking to see do light boxes help even if the individual doesn't have depression? I'm sorry, even if the patient doesn't have seasonal depression? Does it help for just depression if given during winter months in um, high in, in northern areas. So they looked, um, all their sites were above 39 um, degrees of latitude, all of their sites. And they gave them three groups. Um, there was a group uh, that got just the light and the placebo, um, a group that got the light and the fluoxetine, and then a group that got anti uh, a light plus a placebo, like a sham type of light, and then um, a, a complete placebo group. And here's what they noticed after eight weeks. That the group that got the combination did the best, followed by the group that just got the light, followed by the place, uh, fluoxetine group, followed by the placebo group. I guess the nuance to this study is they used a low dose of fluoxetine, which probably um, shows why the fluoxetine didn't do as well. But I think what it really points to is the benefit that can be seen, especially in even if an individual doesn't have the typical seasonal depression. Um, when talking about a light box with a patient, um, I let them know that no light box has been uh, approved by Health Canada, um, but all the studies have shown that where you get the benefit is in a box with 10,000 lux of white light um, UV that has a UV filter. Ideally, they're going to get a light box that's been used in a clinical trial already. Um, and typically, they also sell those blue light boxes. There's been some data to suggest that blue light can um, possibly in some populations increase the risk of macular degeneration. So typically I keep with the white box and you gotta use it for about 30 minutes. Um, and at the bottom here is a light box that I recommend to patients because it was actually used in that past study and is easily accessible at amazon.ca. We wanna screen to make sure they don't have any conditions that could worsen the eyes as well as that they're not taking any photosensitizing medications. All right, so this comes to my favorite portion of the talk, which is about mindfulness. So when I'm learning integrative psychiatry, and I'm learning all the different supplements that can be helpful, at times it can be just mind-boggling. Where do I start? What do I say first? And this is where I've learned that mindfulness is the most important, because it really grounds me in the present moment to be able to know, well, what do I tell the patient sitting in front of me right now? And if I'm grounded in this present moment, I'm going to be a lot better able to do that than if I'm thinking of all the 10,000 studies I've been reading and which one do I go based off of. If I'm able to really be present with that patient. So I'm discuss a little bit about mindfulness. I think many of us in this room already know quite a bit, so I'll be brief here. One, one story that helped me understand it is this idea of, it's called the arrow story. Um, we encounter some, if we encounter something that brings pain or dissatisfaction, we tend to start up a whole bunch of mental processes that lead to more suffering, adding more to the pain. We experience an aversion to dissatisfaction and then indulge in blaming and criticism. So it's as if our response to being shot by an arrow is to shoot ourselves with another arrow. But what if we were to experience the discomfort without reacting to it? We do this by being mindful, cultivating a present, non-reactive, and welcoming attitude towards anything in our experience that seems unpleasant. 
It's about, as John Kabat-Zinn has been quoted saying, paying attention on purpose in the present moment, non-judgmentally, being present right here, right now. So I'm going to hope that when I press the next button, this plays. Oh, there's somebody behind the scenes. So mindfulness is often taught um, in a group setting, um, typically eight, 12 weeks, two hours a session. And they've been using this group mindfulness training, often called mindfulness-based stress reduction. And through various studies, they've shown improvement in anxiety, depression, IBS, autoimmune illnesses, because um, we know that stress is an important part of so many chronic diseases. And what I'll also focus on is physician burnout. They've shown in multiple studies that mindfulness programs were associated with less burnout and physicians and other um, and mental well-being for physicians and other healthcare providers. Um, where it really is important for us as psychiatrists is that we know that um, the depression is often a chronic disease as well. If an individual has had three or more episodes of major depressive disorder, the recommendation is, is usually to be on antidepressant for two or more years. Um, so in this study, what they wanted to see is if we teach people mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, which is a combination of mindfulness and cognitive therapy, if we teach them these specifically to a group that um, has had so many episodes of depression, might we be able to prevent these episodes from happening? So they divided the group into a group, and this was about, I think, 400 people in each group, and they gave half the group um, antidepressants just to continue on as the recommendations and the other group they took them off their antidepressants and they had them join these mindfulness-based cognitive therapy groups and at the end of two years they had equivalent amounts of relapse which is pr pretty mind-boggling I think really helpful for patients who maybe don't want to be on medications for a long term the caveat to this study is that the, the relapse rate was still quite high um, about 40 to 50 percent of people relapsed after two years in this specific population who've had three or more episodes. So perhaps if they did another study where they combined these two, we'd see even better results. And um, this type of therapy showed a, a more robust effect um, in individuals with childhood trauma, which is very exciting as a psychiatrist because we know SSRIs are likely not as effective for those who have early history of trauma. All right, just a couple more studies and then I'll be done. Um, this is entitled, A Wandering Mind is an Unhappy Mind. They gave 5,000 people from 83 different countries um, um, phones, essentially. And they said, we're going to ask you questions throughout the day, and we just need you to text us the response back. And they had a quarter of a million data points. And they asked them, essentially, what are you doing? Are you present for it? And how happy are you? And they found about 46% of the time, the individual's mind was somewhere else. So half the time, we spend not here in our lives. And they also noticed people were less happy when their minds were wandering than when they were not. And this was true during all activities, including the least enjoyable. In fact, people were no happier when thinking about pleasant topics than their current activity. So I was practicing this speech with my husband. And he said, you know what, I tried this yesterday whenever we, I was washing dishes, because I hate washing dishes. And he said, instead of thinking about wanting to go to Hawaii, 
I sat there and just noticed the warm water on my hands. And you know what? That actually kind of works. And I said, yeah, I think you should try it a little more just to make sure. <laughs> so what people were thinking was a better predictor of their unhappiness than what they were doing. This, a group mindfulness-based stress reduction, is um, often available in many larger si areas. I, it is offered here in Saskatoon, um, and it's also offered online. I don't think online is a substitute, but it can often be a step for patients, and it's free online. Um, all the different eight-week sessions with videos and information um, can be found right here. All right, different apps. Um, can also teach mindfulness. One of my favorites is Headspace. It's, um, what I've come to learn is that if I want my patients to adapt a new practice, I actually have to accompany them in there. If I say, download this app and check it out, 95% of the time they won't do it. But if I say, let's do this together for five minutes, and I accompany them through that process. They're much more likely to do that. And I learned it because I had read all these studies about yoga. I knew how wonderful it was, theoretically. But I never did it until my husband one day saw me too stressed. And he said, you need a couple sun salutations. Let me show you how it goes. And after that, I experienced it with him. I was accompanied in that process. And now I love it. And I have it as a part of my daily practice. So I took that technique. And I thought, you know what? This is what I need to be doing with my patients, finding a way for them to experience it right now in the present moment and to be accompanied by it, by myself or somebody else in the clinic. And I think that's why group is so powerful too. So coming back all the way back to Jerry, um, cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, I'd recommend omega-3s, cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, protein-rich breakfast, replacing the coffee with some L-theanine, talking about pro uh, fermented foods. He's already on a probiotic. He noticed some benefits, so I'd monitor that. We talk about a Mediterranean diet. Um, he's had OCD. It's worse now. We talk about N-acetylcysteine, a light box, um, and the mindfulness-based stress reduction program. These are some of the recommendations that I would offer to him, and then I would say, well, which ones do you, what do you think about this? And then create together a collaborative plan. So, 71% um, of Canadians have used natural health products like vitamins and minerals, herbal products, and home homeopathic medicines. And so if we're not hearing that our patients are taking them, often it's because they're afraid to tell us. Um, and oftentimes we might, because we don't know whether they're helpful or not, tell them not to take them, um, which in many patients just says, they say, I'm just not going to tell my doctor what I'm taking, which can make it dangerous. So. This is a wonderful resource um, called Natural Medicines available through the library system and also through purchase um, for those who aren't affiliated with the university any longer. Um, it's a database that shows you essentially put in the supplement and it'll give you um, information about it. It'll give you um, links to PubMed to show you the articles that um, support its use or whatever documentation there's been so far. It'll also design according to disorder where it'll show um, what Supplements, mind-body techniques, nutrition-wise, have been shown to be helpful in various conditions. And it'll also do um, an interaction checker. So if you know your patient is on some supplements and wonder if it interacts with medications, you can look that up. And also it shows if the medications we're giving can deplete nutrients that are vital for the patient. For example, in this one, uh, ranitidine, looking to show that it can decrease B12, calcium, folic acid, and iron. So if we see a patient who's on that who's newly depressed, perhaps we should check for some of these things to make sure it's not from the medicine. So there, if we had more time, we'd talk about so many other things, but hopefully those were at least some highlights. Or, um, but if we had more time, we'd talk about inositol, um, phosphatidylserine, exercise, L-methylfolate, um, curcumin, broad-spectrum micronutrients, and SAMe, because I think these also have quite a bit of increasing support in the literature. Take-home points, what you put in your mouth is important. Um, Mindfulness-based interventions have positive effects for depression, anxiety, as well as many other chronic disease conditions. And this is a great database to have on hand, Natural Medicines Database. I want to thank all my mentors and um, the people in, the, in at both the Arizona Center for Integrative Medicine, where I've trained, as well as the Department of Psychiatry here, which has been so welcoming, um, as well as my family. So I want to say thank you for your attention, and all the slides are available at that link um, below.
we started uh, five minutes late, so we have five minutes, I think, for questions. And maybe afterwards, uh, you could come up and approach Dr. Villa Gomez if needed. Mm -hmm. uh, I see ADHD patients, and I would be horrified if I saw someone with, o with OCD who also had recurrent strep infection because of the possibility of PANDAS syndrome. And uh, the problem with uh, recurrent strep infection is it's not the strep that's a problem, it's the H flu in the middle of the tonsil that is resistant to penicillin that helps the strep come back. And mm -hmm. these people need to be put on clavulant for a week which, to uh, get rid of it once and for all. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so they, then they don't get the recurrent strep infection mm -hmm. again. And uh, I think that's one of the things I would do. Another thing is uh, I'd be very concerned about the coffee consumption because I would suspect he would have restless leg syndrome, which is actually pretty common in ADHD. And not only do they get restless leg syndrome, they get uh, periodic limb movements where they dance all night long and then they can't figure out why they're tired in the morning. Uh, and uh, I would have them uh, monitor to see whether or not this was the case. And, and I use cinnamon or... Uh, any Parkinson-like agents to treat that uh, sort of thing. Uh, so those are two things that come to my mind. I like Sammy, too. <laughs> Thank you for bringing that up. If we had more time, we would have talked about restless leg syndrome, too, because as you mentioned, about 40 to 60 percent of patients with ADHD have restless leg. And what we think might be one of the, the, the link is um, low iron, because um, a lot of patients with ADHD have low iron in general. And so the recommendation is often to check a ferritin, and if it's less than 50 to 75, to replete with iron. There's, there's no evidence that oral supplementation made any difference. It has to be given IV to make a difference, unfortunately. Thank you. Quick question. Just with the increasing prevalence of veganism and vegetarianism, especially amongst young people, I noticed that you only mention fish sources for omega-3s. Um, is there a reason that you don't um, mention or prescribe the plant-based sources of, of omega-3s to your patients? Thank you for that question. Um, so regarding um, the question was talking about vegetarians that we see a lot more of um, in adolescents. So the, this, this is where I get a little bit, it's a, the data is a little bit tricky because the ALA, which is another source of omega-3s, when best as I understand, there's not a whole lot of data to support ALA for use for Im improvement in um, depression and anxiety. It's mostly through EPA that that is seen, um, which is particularly in seafood. Um, Plant-based sources have DHA. In algae, they have DHA, but that's not where the benefit's been shown in the literature. However, having said that, I think the, where I typically go with adolescent patients who are vegetarian is looking at um, processed foods because there's been a lot of thought that perhaps more than the idea of getting more omega-3s in is the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. If they have a lot of omega-6s, which are prevalent in junk food and processed food, then that may be what the underlying issue is with the body. So the idea there would be to talk about the greater plan of minimizing um, processed foods, because vegetarians can be great, right? You can have lots of fruits and vegetables, or you can have Cheetos and crackers and that sort of thing all day, too. So I really delve into that to have a better sense of what kind of oils are they using in their foods and looking at that omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. I haven't seen um, studies to show that DHA specifically is helpful, nor ALA in depression and anxiety, um, but there are in other conditions. Was there anything else that you knew about that area or that you wanted to add? Sorry, I was, I was just looking at some stuff from Stanford in the Cleveland Clinic that talks mm -hmm. about the ALA being... ALA being converted to the EPA and the DAS in the body. So one would assume that you would have the same effects from those. Okay, things. so the conversion rate is, you brought up a really good point. ALA is converted to EPA and DHA in the body. However, that conversion rate is very low. It's about 5 to 10% in males, and in females it's a little bit larger, about 20%. So that's why even ALA I, I don't recommend at this point. Although if the patient took it and find it helpful, then I'd certainly be interested. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So this... Uh